What's up, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Falcons Final Whistle podcast. I'm Scott Baer, and across the Zoom meeting from me right now is Tori McElhaney. Ashton Edmonds is on the road back from Charlotte. Uh, road trip, and yeah. Tori and I flew back. We are recording this at a somewhat unusual time because the Falcons played the Panthers at a somewhat unusual time. On a Thursday night, the game ended late our flight back to Atlanta and then the drive through pouring rain uh, ended even later. So now it's nine 19 in the morning, Tori and I are on precious few hours of sleep. So let's get delirious as we break down the Panthers 25 to 15 victory over the Atlanta Falcons, a game that did not go right for the dirty birds in a lot of different ways. We're going to break all those ways down, um, including something that I wrote about in my column on the last night slash this morning um, about how the Panthers kind of played Falcons football and um, kind of dominated the line of scrimmage and did a bunch of stuff that the Falcons like to do. We're obviously going to talk about the quarterback situation. That's something that Tori wrote extensively about yesterday in a great job, by the way, uh, in addition to some big picture look at where the Falcons stand in the NFC South and uh Also, kind of how the Falcons can use this mini buy, this rest period to try to get right, get back on track because they're at a point now where they've got to start stacking some wins. So preamble over, Tori McElhaney, you have the floor and the spotlight and uh, the microphone. Give me your immediate (laughs) overall general takeaways from Thursday night. Yeah, I thought that just... Overall, and maybe this isn't even like a a just a Thursday night thing now that we're kind of like, I don't know, less than probably what, like seven, eight hours removed from the game, 12 hours removed from the start of the game. Uh, Time is irrelevant. I don't know anymore. (laughs) It's a flat Um, circle. It's uh, Yeah, (laughs) we're we're trying our best here. Um, But uh, essentially what I was thinking kind of as we're sitting here in after the game's over and and kind of thinking back is that this game against the Panthers I really felt like from start to finish offensively even if the stats like kind of don't necessarily back this up to a certain extent I felt like the Falcons offensively just like couldn't ever get going from start to finish it felt like that and I and I felt like I'm not and I tweeted this after the game too when I look at the defensive performance, I wasn't like displeased by what they did defensively. Like, should they have stopped the run more? Yes. Should they probably have caught not one, not two, but maybe even three interceptions that landed in defensive backs hands. Also, yes, all all those things are true, but I thought that they did a good job of keeping the Panthers out of the end zone. And essentially they caused, I think four, three and outs, if I'm remembering correctly, giving the ball back, to the Falcons offense, but I I never felt like the offense could really like capitalize on any moments or any swings in the game that you felt like, okay, like maybe there's an opportunity here. And that's something that I felt like over the course of the last four games in which the Falcons have only won one game. And I'm going to be honest, I don't think they've played consistently in these last four games that they have gone with one win and three losses um, against the Bengals, the Chargers, and then, of course, Carolina twice. When you look at these last four games collectively, it's like there hasn't been something clicking that I feel like was clicking um, during a, a time where, you know, they beat the 49ers and they beat the Seahawks and, and, it, and they beat the Browns and it felt kind of different. Offense, what they were doing offensively. And um, I can't really put my finger on it, um, but that's just kind of like where we're at and where I think the Falcons are at now taking a look back, not only at the Thursday night game, but at the last four games that they've played. Yeah, I think that's interesting to put it that way. And I look at the defensive performance and, you know, we all know what Dean P says that, Uh, you know, yards don't matter points do they gave up 20 last week. Um, They gave up 25 here. I covered Charles Woodson for a long time. He always said that uh, if a defense holds the team to 24 points or less, 
that defense deserves to win the football game. Adamant about that. They gave up 25 here kind of at the last minute. They were at, at 22 for most of the game. Um, the thing that I look at here, and Carolina ran for a bunch of yards the last time that that um, they played Atlanta, but they ran for 232 yards. They ran the ball 47 times, 47 times. Um, that's an ideal Falcons football game, in my opinion. Yeah. And um, what the Falcons do well is that they run the ball well. Um, I think it was kind of surprising maybe to some to hear that entering – Thursday night's game, the Falcons were the number eight overall run defense. Uh, they got beat pretty good, and Carolina made a point to run. They ran 17 of the first 23 plays. They were they racked up more than 130 some odd yards. I don't have that number in 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 front of me. Rushing yards in the first half, they won both lines of scrimmage. That's not me saying that. That's Arthur Smith saying that immediately after the game. And when you do those things and you don't get bailed out by a turnover and your passing game doesn't go bananas, you end up with a result like this. And that's ultimately where the Falcons stand here is that they didn't play their game. The Panthers played their game and did it well. Because when the Falcons are at their absolute best, as they were against San Francisco, they stick it to you on the ground. They defend well. They don't allow a bunch of explosives. They make scoring hard. And that's what it was for Atlanta. They got kind of a taste of their own medicine and it doesn't taste very good. It tastes like that, like generic store brand version Tussin, right? It's like, it's not anything. That you <laughs> I did know. not know where you're going with that. I had no idea. <laughs> I was like, he's going somewhere. I don't know where he's going though. <laughs> yeah. I was trying to think of the name of it and then struggled mightily. Um, it's weird because some of these numbers on critical downs, Dean Pease would probably take one of two in the red zone, six of 15 on third down. Uh, they didn't pass. They, they passed the ball for 101 yards and the yeah. pass defense has struggled. Not so much that they couldn't do it just because they didn't need to do it because they were running the ball so well. The, re the reason why those critical downs were good enough is it's all relative. It's all comparative, right? Arthur Smith said, look, it was ugly and we did pretty well on critical downs, but we didn't, but we did even worse. And he's right. Three of 11 yeah. on third down, one of two in the red zone. Oh, and two on fourth down, um, 4.9 yards per play. They ended up with 138 rushing yards. They still ran the ball 25 times. And my stat lecture is now over Tori, but I guess when I look at this game, I look at a game where they wanted to be the more physical team. They wanted to do some of these things and it got done to them. Uh, Rashawn Evans called it and called it an eye opener um, that not only that they got beat, but they got beat this way. Do you buy into that? That maybe this was kind of like a, Hey, Whoa, that's what we do. And this is where we ended up. Yeah, no, I definitely do. And I think that's the, a really interesting kind of story to come out of Thursday, what Thursday night's game was. And I, I think just kind of looking at offensively, you know, what was really interesting and you and I both talked to Chris Lindstrom in the locker room and it was kind of funny because you talked to him and then I walked up and you finished and I was like, Chris, I'm so sorry. Can I please ask you like three more questions? And he, and he definitely always, knows that we're from the same outlet. Like that's right. It. So he's like, wait, yeah. you guys are together. And then, okay. Yeah, yeah, he it, was it, great. He was. And, and he said something interesting. I don't know if he said this to you. He, he did say it to me, but he said something along the lines of like that. It just wasn't clicking for them at the very beginning of the game. He was like, something didn't feel right. And, and if for, for somebody to say that I, I felt like one is being very honest but also too, like it was putting to words exactly how I felt when that game started. And now this is now the second time that the Falcons have played the Panthers. And it's also the second time that offensively they've had a pretty rough start to the game. If you remember uh, last, or I, this is what, 12 days ago at this point, the first time that they played the Panthers um, started the, the game off with the interception uh, I, I believe it was the second play of the offense, their first drive. And then, of course, 
to go out in the first half and to only rush for 33 yards at a clip of I can't exactly remember, but I want to say it was like less than three yards a carry on average in the first half. I have that and, in front of me. It's it's 2.8 yards per carry. And that included that included a 12 yard run by Avery Williams in the first half. Okay. So that take that with what you will. But essentially I'm saying that no, it wasn't clicking. And Marcus even said he was like, you know, because I asked because it felt like from watching it where in the press box from our vantage point. To me, it felt like Carolina did a really good job of taking what they learned about the Falcons the first time that they faced them and transitioning that to coming out in the first half of this game on Thursday night and making adjustments to where they were kind of dominating up front. And and I use the example of Falcons like wanting to run the ball and not necessarily being able to. And I asked a few people this if it felt like that if it felt like Carolina came in with a different plan and and Marcus Mariota said that yeah they were loading the box a bit more and they were kind of putting pressure on the Falcons to throw the ball a bit more particularly early which is something that we talked about in the press box how it felt like they were going to try and make Marcus Mariota beat them through the air and then you go into this first half and essentially That's what they're doing, and the Falcons don't have hardly any production offensively through the first half at all, and that's just being – I mean, they didn't score a touchdown until well into the second half. So because of that, it it really did feel like, one, Carolina, you're talking about them playing to their game plan and being able to do what they wanted to do and being able to be the more physical front on both sides of the ball in that first half and how that kind of shaped the rest of the game. And I I think the Falcons can kind of use this as a, uh, uh, we, it's kind of an eye opener and we need to figure things out and they have a a, quote mini buy to do that. But it's, it kind of, when you look at these last two games, particularly it's kind of, it's a tough pill to swallow. And that's not my words. That's Marcus Mariota's words. Yeah, and when you think about mini buys, one thing I want fans to understand is during a normal bye week, you get two or three practices on the field for to work things out. After a Thursday game, the players are out of there. It's it's mandatory, so it's more. And then you you get, I guess, an extra practice on a Monday. But this is about the extra time is for coaches to kind of maybe take a deep breath and self scout and figure out what they're going to do. I, I think. I asked after the Cincinnati game if Cincinnati's offense designed a blueprint for how to beat the Falcons defense. They did it. And it's just funny because the Panthers and Bengals couldn't have done it any differently. And this kind of speaks to week to week league and matchup issues and playing to your own strengths and those types of things. And what, what is repeated, right? And if you go back to the Cincinnati game, they had a, uh, they had an, a unique talent in Joe Burrow that can execute a pass heavy game plan in a way that was effective and impactful and very difficult for the Falcons to stop. And not just Joe Burrow, but three receivers that can do what they also did. (laughs) Right. Absolutely. Electric playmakers. When you look at what the Panthers did, and I'm not trying to discount their talent. It's very clear Iki Ekwano is the real deal and they've got some horses up front and they've got uh, some big physical running backs behind them. But this seems like a more executable plan to me is what I'm saying is to be able to run the football well, you know, time and time again, and to, you know, to essentially on defense is the more important thing is to force the Falcons to beat you through the air or at least be balanced if they're now the Falcons ran 40 times against the chargers and lost, which yeah. mind blowing. But um, if, if the Panthers seem very committed to loading up the box, preventing early runs, getting a lead and then pressure, 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 right. Bring more than they got, have more people than they can block. And there were guys open downfield the passing game, as we've said before, simply just wasn't able to execute at a consistent and high enough level 
to overcome the obstacles the team was having in the run game and the fact that they were down multiple scores in the first half. Well, they've been down multiple scores in the first half, and we've talked a lot about how much the Falcons have scratched and clawed to get back in games and to get within one score. They never completed a full comeback. They've gotten right. close, but when they've fallen down by multiple scores in the first half, those games include uh, the LA Rams, the Tampa Bay Bucks, uh, Cincinnati, and this one, they've lost every one, despite cutting it to one score within the last few minutes. So it's obviously not a viable strategy. It's not a place that they want to be. And um, I think that, you know, it, when I look at this game, is it repeatable? Is any game re like repeatable? But I definitely feel like the, the, the Panthers have a more executable game plan um, to assert their will over the Falcons that other teams could emulate. I guess is what I'm trying to say that this may be more realistic in terms of how you're going to go out them and the coaches are going to have to figure out a way to, to avoid, you know, the same traps, I guess, or they have to get the passing game, right? Because if the right, passing right. game is right and they start con uh, connecting downfield again, of which there were opportunities to do so, then it negates all this, they kind of blueprint stuff. Right. Yeah. And I think too, you look at the, I mean, the team that's coming into town, if you're, you're if you're kind of flipping it again and you're, you're going back to your original point about like the Falcons being beaten by their brand of football, you have a team that is coming in after this quote unquote mini buy that is going to run the ball. I think Arthur Smith even said it in his post game presser, like the like Chicago is going to come in here and they're going to try and run the ball 500 times. And it's like, okay, this, if you're in a situation where it's like you have a last second drive that you got to pull off and, and you're having to throw the ball downfield or you do get behind, I mean, it is there and they are running the clock out to a certain extent. Do you have the offensive capability to be able to, to make that type of comeback or to lead a final game winning drive that's the question of kind of where the Falcons are at I think right now offensively and they, I think they do have a good opportunity to kind of when you're looking at the next slate of games it's like okay can you get right in these next slate of games because right now like going back to what I was saying before it's like these last four games have not been it and they, I think they know that. I think coaches know that. Players know that. I think everybody watching knows that. It's like, okay, now what do you do with this information moving forward? Yeah. Um, you wrote about Marcus Mariota, the passing game, the offense in general. I think you mentioned it in your story that Arthur Smith was asked five different questions in his post-game press conference about Marcus Mariota. I think the first question and it was a valid one from the athletics. Josh Kendall was, did you ever consider going to Desmond Ritter after Marcus Mariota went through a day where he completed 19 of 30 passes for 186 yards, all yard, two touchdowns and a pick that stat line maybe looks better than how it looked. He yeah. missed some opportunities. There is no doubt about that. There was one, I thought sure touchdown where he overthrew Kyle Pitts. Um, Kyle Pitts targeted eight times, two catches, 28 yards. Again, I'm not going to, do another stat lecture here, but nonetheless, kind of take over for me here, Tori. Um, what did you learn? What did you hear about Marcus from, from Marcus Mariota about the passing game and what Arthur Smith said uh, when Desmond Ritter's name got brought up? Yeah, I think it's interesting because in a game where it felt like everyone was talking about Marcus Mariota and Desmond Ritter, I feel like Arthur Smith in his post-game press conference was very almost adamant that he was not going to just talk about Marcus Mariota's performance. And I, I felt like it, the line of questioning about if he was going, if he ever thought about putting Desmond Ritter in and his answer was a straight up no. Um, what he kind of thought about Marcus's overall performance. And he's like, you know, y'all can make this about the quarterback, but what about the team? Like we should have protected better. We should have run the ball better. We should have uh, stopped the run better. And he he's listing all of these things as to why the Fal why it's not just quote about quarterback play. And that's what he was saying. And 
So you have your head coach that comes to the podium and is talking and, and is very adamant that it was a team loss and that he wasn't going to point out and he wasn't going to point to Marcus Mariota and his performance and his role in the loss. Now, what's interesting, and this was something that I wrote about, was that when Marcus went to the podium, Marcus was very, uh, I think, not just aware of his role in the loss, but knowing that it wasn't good enough. And and he, he, he made the comment, he was like, you know, he kept saying, like, it starts with me, I can't take those sacks. He was sacked, I believe, five times for a loss of 33 yards. And so he was like, I can't take some of those sacks. Like those, some of those things are on me. Um, connecting with receivers. He, he talked about that. He talked about feeling like he was forcing things because he felt like he needed to provide a spark for this offense that let's be honest, started out sparkless and, and started out kind of on a meh note. Like, I don't even know how else to describe it, but that's how I would describe it. And so he's trying to create the spark and, he has said this before, and he said it again on Sunday where he was like, when I start playing out of myself and when I kind of get in those moments where I'm trying to almost like overplay and overcompensate, like that's when I get myself in trouble. And that was something that he was talking about. And so he was very cognizant and aware of kind of the pressure that I think not just the fan base, but we're talking about Thursday night football and in a primetime slot where it felt like the whole league and multiple fan bases are watching this game and for the Falcons offense to perform that like that with Marcus Mariota as the quarterback, he's going to take a lot of heat. And he was well aware of that. And he, for his part, I think he was, he wasn't defensive. He knew that it wasn't good enough. He talked about, you know, they kept, they letting the Panthers play their game of football and, defend the way that they wanted to and to execute the game plan that they wanted to because they were getting the Falcons in third and long situations. And we know when the Falcons are in third and long situations, they struggle um, because they have to throw the ball because it's an obvious passing down. So all of that to say that Ar Arthur Smith wasn't pointing to Marcus Mariota and he very much shut down any type of conversation about potentially de seeing Desmond Ritter on Thursday night, which I understand if we want to talk about Desmond Ritter, I'm not putting Desmond Ritter into that game. It's a game on a short week. It's a game in not ideal conditions. And it's a game in which your offensive line wasn't necessarily working at the clip that they needed to. And that's something that Chris Lindstrom said. That's not me saying that. It's Chris Lindstrom saying that they need to be better for Marcus and for the team and for this offense. And, a, and you don't have the balance of being able to rely on the run as much as you can. So that's a long-winded explanation as to why I understood the decision not to, to pull Marcus for Desmond. Am I saying that that completely takes away the possibility of seeing Desmond Ritter later? No, that's not me saying that. So I, I want to pref I want to say all of that and add that little two cents in because I'm sure there are a lot of people listening to this wondering why in the world what like why in the world didn't we see Desmond Ritter on Thursday night and those I think are the reasons and I mean if you look at it like at, they had a chance to tie it up in the fourth you know that it wasn't like they were completely out of the game as I think tough as it was at multiple points in the game to feel like the Falcons were in it at one point they were yeah I I look at Marcus Mariota's performance overall, and I look at the struggles of the passing game, and I agree with Arthur Smith in a lot of different ways that uh, he was asked about Mariota's accuracy on some balls, um, and he said, it's hard when you can't even set your feet, man, which is alluding to there isn't enough protection for him to get the ball downfield. And look, I don't want to go into the popular narrative. That's not what I'm trying to do. And I'm not trying to lay the blame at one person's feet when clearly the entire team wasn't good enough. But in this game, th there's a reason why quarterbacks get paid hundreds of millions of dollars. Eventually, yep. whether everything in front of you goes right or wrong, the trigger man has an opportunity. 
right? They have an opportunity to make a miracle happen, make magic happen. We've seen Marcus Mariota do that a ton. Tori and I talk a lot in the press conference of if that was a slower quarterback, that's second and 17. There are also opportunities where you look at it and everything is right or enough is right where he has time to get the ball out to a productive target and it's just inaccurate. That can also be a thing, right? Yeah, all of these things can and are true. Like that's the thing is like, it's not just like a one side. I I feel like Arthur Smith has just like come out of my like mouth because he, he always says it's not a one size fits all thing. And that was about to be what I was saying, but it's true. I mean, it's like with Marcus, I mean, it, it is a little bit of everything right now. And it goes to every level of the offense. And there's not a part of the offense that I don't think is touched by it. But of course, like you're talking about a quarterback and there are a lot of times that games are won on the back of the quarterback. And that's, I think that's kind of the point that we both are trying to get to. Right. That, that this is a, this is a layer cake, but with that quarterback position, you've seen a number of quarterbacks go out and you make a, you know, an important play that turns the tide in, in the game. I used to cover the 49ers and I was at Super Bowl 51, 54, I don't know, Chiefs 49ers, right? And Jimmy Garoppolo played a really solid game, but there was a point where Emmanuel Sanders books it wide open downfield, a complete pass. It's a hard pass, low percentage pass. I get that. If he puts the ball in the right spot, the 49ers win the Super Bowl. It's that simple. I'm sorry. It's that simple. He missed them. They didn't win. He's going to have to live with that, right? That's part of the quarterback position is what I'm saying. Yeah. That, it, that, that at some point, you just have to deliver a good ball. And if you don't, the entire team kind of has to deal with it. Um, anyway, I, I would say, look, in term, you're exactly right. That was not the time to bring in a backup quarterback who's never played a game before in the rain where the running game is slowed. That's so important. He has not, he does not get regular reps with the first unit. It just doesn't happen. There's only yeah. two quarterbacks. He runs the scout team. The scout team runs yeah. the other team system. Okay. Um, there are kind of young guy periods and backup periods. So he does get some, and he's obviously in the meeting rooms and he knows what the heck is going on. And Desmond is a smart guy, but I, I think you and I have both said this Tori. you want to bring, a young quarterback in, in a position where he can succeed. And that was not one of those things. And to Arthur Smith's point, I'm going to channel him too. They found a way to get within one score. They found a way to push and Marcus has done that before. So why would you assume that on this night, he couldn't do that again, that he couldn't flip the script as he has done before, as he did on that drive where he accumulated 82 of his, 189 yards he went 18 21 18 25 something like that he and and, and he took big chunks so why wouldn't Arthur think that Marcus could do that one more time it didn't happen one more time I think the most important thing about this quarterback conversation is the point that you and Marcus brought up about him playing outside of himself you see some of those throws where he's kind of getting thrown to the ground and he's literally just kind of like volleying it up in the air or he's throwing it into heavy traffic, trying to make a great thing happen, but it it ends up being ill-advised. I don't mind the effort, but the execution in the passing game just has to be better or they're just going to put eight, I don't know, nine guys up front and do whatever they can to stop the run. And the Falcons have to adjust to that. Um, And that's really what they have to do moving forward. In my opinion, when it comes to the NFC South standing, we're talking on a Friday. There's still some more games to be played. Right. In the NFC South, we don't know how the standings are going to work out. There's no team above 500. But I think more important than the standings, right? We've talked a lot about the standings because they were on top of them. We're at a different point now, right? Yeah. We're at a different point now. This team is four and six. And it needs to figure itself out before, and there's still seven games left. There's plenty of time to do that, but this team needs to figure itself out before it starts worrying about its standing within the context of the NFC South or of the conference at large. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I think like it's, 
it's one of those things that you do have to look inwardly at this point in time um, because there's so much happening elsewhere. And, you know, I mean, we're proponents of that too. Like where we were, like we've been talking about the standings and really making a point of that because it's, it is important because it is happening. And the Falcons were on top of uh, the NFC South there for, for a little bit, but now I, I completely agree with you that it kind of shifts where it's like, the Falcons just need to get wins and they need to play well consistently through four quarters and kind of to, to get to the point where you feel like you did after the Browns game or after the 49ers game, not after the last four games, even in a win for one of those four games. But even in that win, it's like if that game, if, if, if there is – not one, but two game-winning field goals that are made. That's a different, you're talking about a completely different game. So, and I'm talking about the first time the Falcons played the Panthers. So all of that to say, this has not been a good four weeks for the Falcons. And I think that needs to change in order for them to feel better about where this 2022 season is going. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. They're very, very close to being 0 and 0 for their last four. Yeah. And there are issues that need to be fixed. Opponents see tape and they start adjusting. Now the Falcons have to adjust back. I don't think, and I say that it's not a coaching situation. I, I can't belabor that point enough. I think it's just about improved execution in run defense in past defense in previous weeks and trying to get the passing game to a point where it doesn't have to be perfect. They don't have to throw the ball 62 times, but when Kyle Pitts is open and he's your target and you throw it towards him, you got to hit him. I, it's it's yeah. at some point it's just that simple. Um, yeah. With three, with like three yards of separation, you got to hit him. You just do. And you did last week, right? That, we can talk about route depth and concept, but at some point you just got to hit them. You just got to go make a play. And that's, in my opinion, the, the difference between the Falcons coming up on the short end of some of these close games and being on the other side. That's not necessarily Scott and Tori's recipe for Falcon success. I think that's common sense more than anything else. Yeah. Just you have to execute better. The scheme is good. The game plan is good. You have to execute better. You have to take advantage of the opportunities. These games are all going to be close. That's how the Falcons play. That's what their kind of roster dictates. And that's how the NFL is right now. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's something that you said back in week one. And I kind of raised my eyebrow at you because I was like, uh, that game never should have been close against the Saints. And it turns out we've there's so many one score games, regardless of who you who who is perennially good or bad. So yep. nonetheless, we've Tori and I set out to talk for 15 to 20 minutes. I'm staring at my Zoom um, screen and they're saying, we're getting ready to kick you off because I'm <laughs> upgrade, which means we've gone a lot longer than that. So let's cut it off right here. Any final thoughts or you want me to start doing the final spiel? Go ahead. I'll give you the final spiel floor. All right, y'all do what you do. Rate, review, subscribe to the Falcons podcast network on iTunes and Spotify or join us on YouTube. Won't you? That place is a, it's a fun little community where we put tons of videos and including video podcasts where you can also see not only Falcons final whistle, but also Falcons audible with Derek DJ and Dave and Falcons in Focus, our passion projects, Tori and I have, where we go in depth with Falcons players. You get to know them on a more personal level. Away from the game, it's the best part of our week. So please find a way yeah. to listen to that. It, in my opinion, getting to know these players deserves a a a, uh, a big audience. Um, and nonetheless, we have a great weekend. By the way, I'm saying this to you, Tori, and to oh, <laughs> everyone listening. Um, and we will catch you next week in 10 days or so uh, after the Falcons play the Chicago Bears. We'll talk to you then. See ya. Yeah.